The uh, pieces of paper that you've received, I, I was hoping to uh, make enough room at the end for some questions, and I rather despaired that there would be. Um, so I just wanted to give you something. If there are questions that come up, uh, I would love it if you would write them down and give them to me. Um, as you know, I'm working on a series on practicing with difficult emotions and would really love to be able to incorporate responses to your questions in the, in the talks that I'm developing. So uh, please feel free, and if not, just give me back the empty piece of paper, that's fine. But just wanted, to, wanted you to have something. So the title of my talk tonight is Finding Balance, Practicing with Difficult Emotions. Balance is a really hard thing anytime we're using language because words tend to imply not the, not the other thing, you know. So anytime we're sort of talking about something, it's, it really kind of narrows it down into uh, this. And, you know, ultimately there is just awareness of it all. So bear with me as we, as we try to find some balance and try to find some language to uh, speak about difficult emotions. And I don't know about you, but I find uh, teachings on emotions to be really often very, very puzzling. Um, you know, we read things, we see things in, our, in the on Dharma Seed or in books where, uh, you know, destructive emotions or um, unwholesome emotions or unskillful emotions. And, and then we think, well, I should just, you know, pack it up right now because, you know, this is just, this is just not, you know, I, I have all this stuff going on and, and, you know, what do I do with it? And besides, even my little baby, my, you know, has difficult emotions and so what do, you know, what, how, do, how, how, how are we to make sense of these, uh, these energies uh, of our human beingness um, in a way that, that is somehow balanced and coherent and wise and sensible and wholesome and all of those good things. And that doesn't invite us to uh, go to war with uh, parts of ourselves or with one another. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we work with all this? Um, the description uh, that I wrote on the web is, uh, I wanted to start with it, the Buddha taught that the purpose of life is to cultivate a capacity for the happiness that is not afflicted by changing internal and external conditions. At times, however, our ordinary human emotions can seem to be barriers to this promised spiritual freedom. So this, in this talk and discussion, we will inquire together, uh, that was the together was hoping to have room for questions, um, into the ways that our spiritual practice can enable us to know and manifest a wholesome relationship with these universal and often challenging emotional life energies. So it isn't like, you know, I'm going to offer one talk tonight and then everything will be completely lucid. But um, what I wanted to do tonight was to offer some principles to keep in mind when we're inquiring together about difficult emotions, some sort of overview perspectives that I, I think might be helpful. Uh, and there are three of them that I came up with. Um, and then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some resources that I'm gonna be offering also. So the first principle um, is, what is it <laughs> that we are talking about when we talk about emotions? And um, I was telling somebody today, I've been studying this really very, very, very diligently, both in you know, reading and study and my life and practice for um, very intensely for about two years. And you know, I keep kind of scratching my head. It's like, well, what is an emotion anyway? And I found um, 
something the other day that, finally, the other day that was somewhat reassuring, um, that uh, somebody in 2010, uh, apparently they identified that there are 34 emotion researchers who are like world famous as specialists in emotion. And they surveyed those 34 people and asked them, what is an emotion? And they got 34 different responses. <laughs> Um, so if we're confused about emotions, it's, it's, it, it's important to remember, you know, the first principle, what is it that we're talking about, is that the language of emotion is incredibly varied. And it's very important that we understand where somebody is coming from when we are um, investing, when we're reading something or hearing something about difficult emotions. Because otherwise, we can get just royally confused. You know, these 34 people, they kind of go, oh, that's Paul Ackman and that's what he thinks about emotions, that's what he thinks emotions are. Um, and so to really kind of understand that, first of all, just on a purely psychological level, the world's experts on emotions, not, not two of them agree with one another about what it is they're talking about. Are they talking about physiological manifestation? Are they talking about how the nervous system functions? Are they talking about chemistry? You know, how the hormones and the body chemistry, how they're talking about how that works? Are they talking about physical damage or not? You know, kind of intact physical structures? Um, are they talking about behavior, expression, language, action? Are they talking about thinking? You know, what, it, what are they talking about? And very often in research, people will be speaking of one of those to, to the more or less exclusion of, of the other. And they, then they disagree with one another about what's important, not surprisingly. Remember, I've, I've taught about, you know, the Buddhist teaching on the wise men and the elephant. And so, with respect to just purely psychology, um, we have 34 different views of what's an elephant. Um, all of which are in their own way legitimate, but that it's important to know that when they're saying, no, it's, you know, it's swishy and bushy, and, or it's hard and it's rough, you know, or it's all kind of wet and soggy and has water, you know, coming out at the end, that, that, that really they're talking about different, different uh, kinds of understandings of what emotions are. Um, and then we can know that, okay, that's just psychology and, you know, one's psychology is affected by context by social, you know, by all kinds of sociological sorts of things, by all sorts of cultural kinds of conditioning, family kinds of conditioning, so that what people are talking about now gets even more complex. So there are now, there's a psychology elephant, and then there's a cultural elephant, and then there's an anthropological elephant. And so now we have people talking across elephants about, or maybe even across species, about what an emotion is, and how it really works. Um, one kind of common, um, mm, I'll call it a definition, it's not really a definition, it's more like a summary um, that they came up with from the survey of the 34 people. An emotion is a pattern of neural activity in the whole system including inputs from bodily states. So you're getting input from inside, what's going on inside, and from what you're seeing, and, and from external senses, what's going on outside, with numerous feedback loops. Everything is kind of constantly feeding back and amplifying or, 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 or uh, suppressing other aspects of this information. Um, so it's just, it's just this constant flow of information back and forth and back and forth and then behavior and thought and feeling states, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, all of that really is affecting 
our, 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 our sense of, you know, what's happening at any given time. Um, Ken Wilber has an interesting um, kind of um, overview of elephants, if you will, um, where he talks about, you know, I talk about different kinds of elephants. He talks about different lines of development and that there's this psychology line. There's this sort of sense of how we make sense of these neural circuits that go on and these thought forms that go on, how we make sense of it and how we make a sense of a self. And then there's our cognitive development and how we, you know, how, if you will, how smart we are or how much education we have. And then there's our moral development and then there's our physical development. And so there are all these lines of development and each line has a certain level. And so it's at various points in our, in our experience, we're at this level or we're at this level or we're at this level. Um, you know, we kind of get, and the levels get more and more comprehensive and more and more inclusive as they get more and more, if you will, developed, like the human being, you know, as we grow, presumably, as we grow as children, um, we get more and more complex so that we're able to kind of take in and integrate more and more complex information from, uh, you know, across, uh, within a level and then across these different levels. The culmination of each level is spirituality you know, and the, there is a separate spiritual line so that there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a separate, if you will, spiritual line of development. Now the Buddha didn't talk about any of these things. The Buddha didn't concern himself with development. He didn't concern himself really with psychology or cognitive <laughs> development or how children development develop. He didn't concern himself with any of these things. But just in our in our purely human form, you know, there are all these different dimensions, all these different levels. Um, and so people are talk, people are speaking, you know, about all these, all these different things and no wonder it's confusing. No wonder it's confusing. We haven't even gotten to Buddhism yet, you know. In terms of the spiritual line, people talk about, you know, levels, if you will, of spiritual development. Um, and when you read, um, say, a Buddhist text or you hear a talk on Buddhism, they are either talking about one of the higher levels of a particular line or they're talking about a separate line that is spiritual development. It is fascinating. There's one book that I read that was a dialogue between Paul Ekman, who's one of these 34 researchers, and the Dalai Lama. And the book was incomprehensible. And, you know, I tell you, I've been studying this for like years. And I'm a psychologist, so I've been studying it even longer than that. And the book was incomprehensible, and I finally figured out the reason it was incomprehensible is that they're each talking in their own language, but they're not understanding that they're talking in their own language. And so they're talking past each other all the time. And you can't figure out what they're, what are you talking about? It was so fascinating. Paul tried to get the Dalai Lama to say that anger was a good thing sometimes. And it was just absolutely hysterical reading, you know, the gymnastics that, first of all, that the scientists were going through trying to get the Dalai Lama to say anger was a good thing. And the Dalai Lama trying to kind of stand on his left earlobe trying to kind of accommodate them and understand it somehow, but really not really, because in Buddhist practice, it's really not. And, but how does it make, you know, how does it all make sense? It really does, by the way, all make sense if you understand where they're coming from and what it is they're talking about. Um, so if you're confused when you read these things or if you're confused when you have rage and you go, this isn't very spiritual, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Clearly, I'm, you know, not a very wholesome practitioner. Um, really, it's important to kind of get where, what is it, what is it that's happening here? And at what level do you need to pay attention? Now, I'm not, a I'm not answering that question, which is a bit more complex than a five-minute summary here. But but just to nevertheless, as a starting place, that there isn't a one-size-fits-all discussion of anger or anxiety or depression or any of those groovy things. Um, 
from anywhere, even if you just take just psychology. I guess I've said that enough to make my point. Um, from in Buddhist practice, so in, in Western practice, in a general way, emotions are said to be unwholesome if they cause harm to yourself or somebody else. You know, it'd be more like if, if, if you're hurting yourself in some active way or if you, you know, if you um, shoot somebody, you know, and leave a dead body around. It's considered not wholesome, you know. Um, so, so that in Western practice, really it's more about how you behave. Maybe how you think, but mostly how you behave. So when people talk about unwholesome you know, emotion, really a lot of the time they're talking about how you think or how you behave. Um, in Buddhist practice, um, they are talking about that, um, and that's the whole uh, aspect of our practice that's um, ethical ethical practice. We actually don't even talk about all that much as we, you know, when we, when we do our spiritual teachings, our, our Dharma talks. So there is that, but really the Buddha is talking about um, states of, um, what, delusions, this is the Dalai Lama, delusions are states of mind which when they arise within our mental continuum, so in our mental process, leave us disturbed, confused, and unhappy. Um, so really kind of talking about a different level, both a different line and a different level, something that leaves us, us, me, disturbed, confused, and unhappy. Therefore, those states of mind which delude or afflict us are called delusions or afflictive emotions. So states of mind that leave us uh, confused, disturbed, and unhappy. You know, so what we're talking about when we're talking about our Buddhist practice is really a, a kind of, if you will, a higher state of wellness than what we're talking about when we're talking about psychology. Psychology basically is talking about dead bodies, you know. And in our Buddhist practice, we're talking about a state of mind and indeed a state of, ultimately, in enlightenment, a state of awareness that has no confusion, disturbance, or unhappiness in it. Um, you know, presumably if you murder somebody, you have some, distur you know, you, you have some disturbance in it. But in Buddhist practice, we're talking about a state of mind uh, that has no disturbance in it that no matter what happens, no matter what news you watch on TV, no matter who says what to you, um, that it doesn't leave you disturbed, confused, and unhappy. Um, so so it's an incredibly wholesome state to um, aspire to, but to use it as our, as our yardstick, you know, of our, of our goodness at any given moment is not so wholesome. Because then we end up with a state of mind that is turning against ourselves, which is exactly the opposite of what the intention of the practice is. Uh, um, so, so anyway, so to kind of have, okay, what is it exactly that we're dealing with? So when we have a, a confused or disturbed state of mind, it's important that we look to see w what is this and w what's needed. I was telling, I was telling somebody, I, I was reading today, I can't, I can't remember if I can even quote it properly, but he was talking, he was saying, when we have these disturbing emotions, he said, what is, what is it that they're inviting us to discover? You know, what is this, what is it inviting us to discover? And at what level is it inviting us to discover? It? Um, so we, you know, the invitation is to begin to inquire. Um, um, in our language, it's hard because, again, our language is a language of duality. And so as, as soon as we start talking about a wholesome state of mind, then anything that's not, you know, we start to measure ourselves against this wholesome state of mind and, and we start to get into trouble. Um, so basically, um, w when we're talking about emotion, we're talking about our achieving the happiness of not spending the rest of our lives in prison. 
Is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about efficiency, the happiness of having a good relationship and to get things done with our work colleagues? Are we talking about the happiness of a loving, wholesome relationship with our spouse or our children? Are we talking about that kind of happiness? Are we talking about the happiness of a back that's not thrown out or a head that's not aching all the time from stress? Is that kind of happiness? Are we talking about the happiness of a satisfying meal? Are we talking about the happiness of a full and ultimate awakening, a life that can ride the ups and downs of, of life with calm and ease and peace and freedom from suffering? You know, what, what's the happiness that, that, we're, that, that we're kind of inquiring into? So even as we aspire to that ultimate happiness, um, at times we might even have that as our ultimate goal, but in this particular moment, the happiness I'm aspiring to is to not end up in prison, you know, or to not harm my, you know, my neighbor somehow. Um, so it really, we have to look carefully. It's not that they're not related to one another, um, but there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all. The second principle I wanted to invite us to consider is the principle of balance. Um, we all know that the Buddha taught the middle way. And I want to read to you something. Um, it's a little bit long, and those of you who were on the retreat heard, actually heard an even longer version. Um, but the Buddha's discovery of the middle way was really quite profound. Um, and it was a middle path out of this duality. You know, he had, he, he had a life of sensual pleasure. He ha and then he spent six years in this incredible asceticism of trying to deal with the drives of, you know, longing for sensual pleasure by, by being incredibly ascetic. And this was his moment of, a, of understanding about that. <clears throat> um, and this is Ajahn Suchito who's writing about this moment. And this is still Siddhartha before the awakening. Um, most recently he had been part of a group of six ascetics whose view was that the way to liberation opened through disregarding or suppressing the senses. Eating solid food was to be done begrudgingly, if at all. The body was to be chastised and its needs given no attention. In this, as in all his previous spiritual disciplines, the seeker excelled his companions, and yet he knew that he, he had attained no superior state and gained no liberating wisdom. So he hadn't achieved that ultimate goal that he was looking for. At this critical point, reduced to a scrawny creature of little more than flaking skin and bone, he had left his group to intensify his practice in solitude. Finally, he found a grove of trees and took up the sitting position at the root of a fig tree. Determined to sit in full awareness, mind bent on investigating whatever might arise in his consciousness, his aim was to see if there could be a way through the shifting manifestations of thoughts, sensations, and emotions to discover whether there was some absolute and untrammeled state. Well, that's what we're all doing here, aren't we? Yet, as he tried to apply himself, he found that his body was now too weak to even sustain sitting upright, nor was his mind steady and clear. Well, that's a problem. Strained and driven only by willpower, it could neither open nor settle into calm. Instead, his mind formed voices that whispered in his inner ear, some accusing, some mocking. Strange visions flittered through the shifting veils of consciousness. He was unable to repel or to investigate them. A despondent inertia hovered over him like a vulture. There were some slight sounds and a quiet voice that at first barely made an impression on his mind. Groggy as he was, his awareness still sensed a shift in the gloom of his near-death state. Pulling apart the eyelids which had glued shut, he made out the form of a young woman, kneeling in front of him with a dish. Sujata asks for your blessing, noble one, 
she said gently as she laid the dish in front of him. Please partake of my offering so that my generosity can be fulfilled. He moved his lips, but his throat could not form words. Yet her kindness touched chords in his heart, and a sense that had been ignored for years stirred. Before he could form a thought, his head had made a movement of assent, and one skinny hand had lifted in response. Sujata smiled and withdrew, and while allowing the natural instinct to move through him, the seeker found himself carefully scooping a meal of sweet milk rice from the dish, one slow mouthful at a time, until he had consumed it all. Life flowed through his system like the sap that fed the tree under which he sat. Why not, he thought, let nature look after nature. What good is there in fighting against its laws? Why not let it support me in this quest? With his body refreshed and his mind clearing from its near-death delirium, he sat cross-legged and upright under the canopy of the tree and steadied his awareness on the experience of breathing in and out. It suddenly occurred to him that when he was a child, he had done just that, quite spontaneously, and it had taken him to a place of natural calm. Eagerly, he picked up the theme. And the story, uh, Ajahn Suchita's story, which we know actually goes through, th it wasn't the end. This is not his enlightenment. It wasn't the end point, because he had all sorts of turmoil through the night. Um, but it was the, you know, the nature looking after the nature, the feeding himself, s nourishing himself in the middle way, not, not too ascetic, not too indulgent, in the middle way that gave him the nourishment to go on and deal with the rest of the story, the rest of what was to come. So this notion of balance and the middle way you know, he says, let nature look after nature. What good is there in fighting against its laws? Um, uh, Venerable Tunisuro has a lovely metaphor, and the Buddha also has a, quite a few metaphors. Um, but that he, but Tunisuro's metaphor is from uh, one of his teachers. Is a mountain heavy? It may be heavy in and of itself, but as long as we don't try to lift it up, it won't be heavy for us. This is a metaphor that one of my teachers, Ajahn Suwat, often used when explaining how to, so to stop suffering from the problems of life. You don't deny their existence. The mountains are heavy, and you don't run away from them. As he would further explain, you deal with problems where you have to and solve them where you can. You simply learn how not to carry them around. That's where the art of the practice lies. That's where the art of the practice lies. In living with real problems without making their reality burden the heart. So this place of balance, of being able to, for example, see anger, see murderous rage, see sadness, you know, see the heaviness of depression, investigate it, What's needed here? But to not carry it around. Now, that too can become as like, oh, bad me, I'm carrying it around. That's not the point, you know. The point is how, you know, we, we sit with it and we go, I don't have a clue how not to carry this around, you know. I can feel the weight of it. I can feel the, you know, the way that it's afflicting my mind. I don't know how not to carry it around that then becomes the investigation. That then becomes the inquiry. Um, you know, how do I not carry it around? The Buddha had all kinds of metaphors. He talked about us uh, like a traveler passing through a thick forest bordered by a swamp on one side and a precipice on the other. You know, you know so when we're dealing with some of these afflictive emotions, you know, we know this, don't we? You know, the swamp on the one side and the precipice on the other. If I'm not acting it out, you know, you know, then I'm just, you know, sunk in some kind of 
heavy, you know, swamp. Um, how, do I, how do I navigate this? Another metaphor he used is, he says, you know, we can be like a man swept away by a stream, seeking safety by clutching at reeds. The, you know, the perils of either extreme, either trying to kind of hang on. Another metaphor that he used is, you know, just standing on the shore and wanting to cross over, but, but you know, being afraid to move, being afraid to, to move. And then the other extreme of just being caught in the river and just kind of carried off, you know, carried off with whatever, whatever the emotion is. So can we, you know, can we find a way? That, um, this story that I read was at the beginning of a book by, um, so of talks of Ajahn Suchito on uh, Paramitas, which w the title of the book is Crossing Life's Floods, you know, Life's Floods. So it's not, you know, it, to, to know that there are floods in life, there are difficulties, there are these arisings, there, you know, we have these nervous systems, we have we have these psychological wounds even, you know, the line, the psychological line has for most of us not gone just incredibly perfectly smoothly, right? You know, we, we, we have places of woundedness and, you know, somebody can say something and we are just off to the races of afflictive emotion. And rather than saying, oh, okay, you know, I'm not spiritual enough, that maybe the inquiry is, what's the wound that's wanting my attention? What's, you know, what's, what's the experience that, that, that is, this is calling for an inquiry? Um, one of the other um, metaphors that you've heard me uh, speak of is the Buddha speaking of tuning a lute, you know, having strings on the lute that are not too tight and not too loose. And so in dealing with some of these challenging energies of our lives, how do we relate to whatever it is that's coming up with strings, if you will, that are not too tight and not too loose. You know, you know, oh, it's okay, I can act out, I can be unskillful in whatever way I choose. Well, maybe that's one extreme. Maybe the other extreme is, you know, to just kind of be caught in this, in, in kind of, in, this, in the stream of it and just be carried, be carried away or to be caught in the, in the judgment of, you know, bad me because this energy is arising. So to kind of cultivate the capacity to navigate it with balance, with some balance. Um, let nature look after nature. And part of that, part of that balance is allowing ourselves the goodness of the food that we need for the journey. On the retreat, um, I offered a whole talk on Food for the Journey. Um, gave a whole series of talks, I guess about a year ago, they're on the web someplace, on cultivating the wholesome, you know. And I did that deliberately, knowing that I wanted to teach on difficult emotions, and that if we don't put it in the context of food for the journey, um, you know, we're like the Buddha sitting there eating one grain of rice without the energy, without the nourishment to carry on and to really do the kind of inquiry that's, that's invited. And the third principle I would like to offer you um, is to not insist that we would, we would be better somehow if we started somewhere else. 